Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, a prophetic seg segment of our broadcast this evening. France-Israeli-Palestinian Peace Summit set for January the 15th, according to the Times of Israel. And of course, several other news outlets already bringing this out. Obama is wasting no time, at, uh, as we've already mentioned in a broadcast the other day, of getting the the two-state solution uh, set in stone, as it were, before President Donald Trump-elect could take office. So there's been a lot of scrambling in the back and behind the scenes. John Kerry working fervishly, and they're going to try to capitalize on their gains with uh, the Resolution 2334 that just got passed recently by the United States abstaining from the vote. They would not veto it. Of course, Russia right in there voting for it. Uh, that they would halt the settlements, but it's not just the settlements. It's also to go back to divide Jerusalem and effectively uh, take away Jerusalem from the, the Jewish people that have been living there since 1967. And there's been a lot of contention over this whole idea to begin with. Now, I, for one, have never been for a two-state solution. I've always been for a one-state with equal rights for both Palestinians and Israelis living inside the same country. That's really the way it should be. It should be more like the United States. We even have Palestinians and Jews living in the United States. We have Arabs and Jews in government in the United States, and it's not a big deal. Why should it be any different inside of Israel today, or for that matter, the West Bank? But it does seem to become a major contention and one that just doesn't seem to want to go away. And it has a lot to do with what's being fueled in the background. The anti-Semitism towards Jews being fueled to the, by the Palestinians, which is also coming from external sources. And it is taught in every school, practically in the West Bank, to hate Jews, kill Jews, and everything else. I know for a fact I was a victim of a suicide bombing in 2004, although I was not injured as far as a victim of that nature there, but I was there when the girl blew herself up there near French Hill, right outside the neighborhood I lived in. Now that neighborhood that has been a Jewish neighborhood for ever since I can remember, Givat Hamivitar, is now part of the West Bank, according to the 1993 Oslo Accord that Shimon Peres signed with the Vatican uh, some time back there, promising also to turn Jerusalem into an international city, according to the 1947 uh, uh, UN agreement back in 1947, taking away complete sovereignty of the Israeli people to govern their own affairs nor making Jerusalem their capital. They are, in effect, as we've seen in another article recently, they are going to take and kick out 400,000, nearly a half million Jews from settlements and throw them completely out of the West Bank. Talk about apartheid. If you ever looked at the resolutions that were done by the United Nations in 1947, as I've mentioned before, it clearly states there would be no Jews living in the West Bank, neither would there be any, any Arabs living inside of Israel. But the funny thing is, is the Israeli government doesn't see it that way. They have no problem with Arabs living amongst them, nor participating in the government there. But as far as the West Bank, under Mahmoud Abbas, it's totally different. It's the other way around. Let me just share with you real quick something that Prime Minister Netanyahu actually stated recently here in this video here. Now this is where he's not very happy with John Kerry and his latest speech there. But let me share with you what he said here just in the speech the other day when he was reprimanding John Kerry for his words that he is saying and not allowing Israel to govern their own matters in a two-state solution. Listen to this right here. I'm so committed to peace because for anyone who's experienced it, as I have, war and terror are horrible. I want young Palestinian children to be educated like our children for peace. But they're not educated for peace. The Palestinian Authority educates them to lionize terrorists and to murder Israelis. My vision is that Israelis and Palestinians both have a future of mutual recognition, of dignity, mutual respect, coexistence. But the Palestinian Authority tells them that they will never accept and should never accept the existence of a Jewish state. So I ask you, how can... This is the type of situation, and I realize, granted, friends, when I, when I say these things to you here, I realize that the Israeli government has not been the best friend in the world working with for the Palestinians either. 
but I've also watched very carefully as the Palestinian government has clearly been influenced by outside external powers there to try to bring about unrest intentionally in order to bring about the type of resolution that the United Nations would like to see. Now, to make the point clear about this, as I mentioned the other day, we went back and we looked at what was going on back all the way back to 1922 with the League of Nations. The League of Nations, which is basically the foundation of the United Nations, and they only, all they did was change name and charter. But in the 1920s there, the mandate for a Jewish homeland was, as you see here on the map here and behind me here, this was the mandate for what they called Palestine. That's one reason why you see these maps that are, that are used in propaganda today, where they show in 1947 little white splotches in what we call modern-day Israel, and they say this were the settlements of the Jews, and the rest of it is all dark, and they said, and this was Palestine. Well, the mandate for a Jewish homeland by the British mandate of 1920, April 24th, was, as you see here, they called it Palestine. The Jewish people renamed it Israel. At that time, in this entire area, which is modern-day Jordan and Israel, West Bank, and Gaza, all included in one place there, there was only about 400,000 Arabs at that time living in this region. Most of those Arabs ended up going here to the right here, to the east of the Jordanian River, or excuse me, the Jordan River, because what, it did, what happened was later that land was given away to a, uh, 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 it's not Hasmonean, uh, I forget the name, Hashmonite uh, king, who actually was given this land by the British government as a reward for fighting and helping toppling, toppling the Ottoman Empire. That's when we get this photo, this map here drawn. And they changed the whole idea. The Jewish Palestine, as it read there, Mandate for Palestine, July 24th, 1922, showing the area of Transjordan in which the reconst reconst reconstitution of the Jewish national home was to be postponed or withheld. The territory of the Jewish Palestine has been reduced by 77% of the original mandate. Again, this is how things all get changed. And even today, many of the Jewish people that are inside of Israel that are trying to get peace with the Palestinians as well, very many, I'm talking about uh, people that are very much opposed to that of the Israeli government, the current government, and the way things are going. People like Annette Benoun. Annette also, she is an Israeli uh, living inside of Israel that is very much against uh, the, you know, the settlements that are being built inside of the West Bank. And I can agree with Annette in certain areas because I do not believe that we have the right to just take land away from someone and build a settlement on. But nonetheless, as a Jew or a Palestinian, either one, if there is land for sale and you can buy it, then it should be allowed to be purchased. As it was done before the British mandate ever came along, when the Ottoman Empire was still in, in, in existence, when Jews came from different parts of Iran into modern-day Israel today and purchased land and were dwelling amongst the very few scattered Arabs in this region at that time. But this is what happened. They went from being uh, this, as we see here on the map, where all of this was given to the Jewish people under the British Mandate of 1920, to they ended up going to 77% of the land was given away to a king over there to help fight the battles as a reward. And as I brought out in other broadcasts, a clear fulfillment over in Daniel chapter uh, 11, I believe that was chapter 11, verse 39 there. Um, and I may be wrong on the verse right now. I'm just doing it by the top of my head on my memory there. But where this speaks about that king that, or excuse me, where the, uh, this military power comes up strong with a, stra a foreign god being Rome and the British Empire joining together and that they would divide the land for gain. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Now, if you'll notice, though, then they had decided that everything west of the Jordan would go to the Jewish people. And of course, at that time, there were about 80,000 Jews living in the land at that time. But what happened is suddenly the British decided, because the Arabs were giving them a hard time about allowing the Jews a homeland, they didn't know what they suddenly began to curtail the number of Jews that were allowed to come. And in World War II, 
For six years, not a single Jew was allowed to come to the Promised Land at all. But when it came to immigration on the other side, though, both the, from Egypt and from now Transjordan, they began to ship in Arabs into the state there in order to try to populate as much as they could. So the state began to change more and more. So by the time of 1947 come along, this is what Israel was looking like here. And this was a new plan in 1947 that was offered to both Jews and to Palestinians as they call them Palestinians. They were actually Jordanians and Egyptians that were living in the land. They had offered them this as a settlement of a two-state solution then. The Arabs, though, the Jordanians and Egyptians that were living in this part of the land now, rejected this completely. And in 1948, the Jewish people that were living in the land had to fight to be able to live in what they wanted to declare as their own state. At that point, as you can see the red circle in the middle, the, the, under the uh, UN resolution in 1947, they were going to take Jerusalem and make it an international city ran by a foreign regime. Well, we know who that regime was. It was Rome. Rome was the one that wanted to run that. And they ran it ever since then until Israel took it over in 1967. And when that happened, this is when all the trouble began. Of course, the lines changed drastically at that point. Uh, after the 1948 war and after the 1967 war, what we know today as Gaza shrunk a lot compared to what they would have gotten. Now... They're talking about getting rid of Jerusalem once again and pushing the Jews out of this area here. And things are going to change again quite drastically. So when we begin to look at this, as I've stated before and over and over again, there's been a lot of changes that have happened as regarding to this land to begin with. A lot of promises were made but never kept by the United Nations. So no wonder why. And you know, this is why I say, I am not for going in and taking land from people that are living in the West Bank. I am not for the government doing that at all. I am for peace and coexistence. But you do have to come to a place where you can negotiate this situation out. Now, I know it doesn't go too well a lot of times with the Israeli government or with the Palestinians, but there is issues on both sides, and that's something I know. And as far as the United Nations and what they're doing, believe me, the United Nations are not helping matters at all. The United Nations has done nothing but break promise after promise after promise based on whatever Great Britain had to say about it. If Britain decided to give away the land, the United Nations went right along with it. They decide to give it away again, they go right along with it. Of course, the United Nations, the British Empire, even as we see in the book of Daniel, clearly had control of a major part of the world to begin with. They uh, certainly ruled most of the world under the authority of the Vatican, without a doubt. Now, so this is what's going on now, and we see that happening. But then there's something else. A new curveball came in. We saw Prime Minister Netanyahu really make a stand against the United Nations Resolution 2334. He's made a heavy stand against John Kerry. And suddenly, we find out this article here today. Sputnik News is reporting that Israeli media attorney general approves criminal investigation into Prime Minister Netanyahu. An investigation for bribes once again. And whether or not it's true or not, I can't say myself. I certainly hope that it's not. But I have a feeling, though, it's biblical prophecy in the making, and I want to share that with you. And by the way, we do intend to be in France on January 15th to cover this historic event where the 70 nations of the world will come against Israel. Another biblical prophecy that will be being fulfilled at that very time. And we've shared that with you just in our broadcast the other day. It is the nations of the world are coming against Israel. They're standing against them. There is a political stand first before the military stand comes next. But let's take a look at this. According to Sputnik News, Israeli media is reporting that Attorney General uh, Avi Chai um, uh, Mandel Mandelblit has approved a full criminal investigation into Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's financial activities. On Wednesday evening, Israel's Channel 10 reported that the Prime Minister will be under investigation in two separate affairs, but did not go into detail on the focus of either one. What is this particular so-called, according to what they're reporting here, 
that there is a case of bribes. Now, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu has also already dismissed this as ridiculous to begin with, but it is over a military transaction with the German government. And they're claiming that he took a bribe in return back in 2009. And of course, they say the case has been secretly going on the entire time. I have a feeling, though, this is biblical prophecy. Prime Minister Netanyahu, if you happen to listen in or any of the friends there in the Knesset that do listen to our channel here, you might want to pay close attention because it doesn't look very favorable when we look at Daniel chapter 11. Let's begin here at verse 21. And in his place shall stand up a contemptible person upon whom had not been conferred the majesty of the kingdom, but he shall come in a time of security and shall obtain the kingdom by blandishments or flatteries. I believe the King James Version Bible actually calls it here by the kingdom by flatteries. This is talking about the prince that shall come that we find in Daniel 9, 27, 24. I think verses 24 to 27 there where it speaks about that prince that shall come. All right. And in here, he comes in at a time of security when the United Nations has already divided the land. Watch what happens here. And the arms of a flood shall be swept away from before him and he shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, and he shall come up and become strong with a little people. I've shared that with you guys many times. The league that was made was hit with him was with the Jewish Congress. They signed it, the Nostra Aetate, with the Vatican. It was about, I don't know exactly the number, some 20 plus rabbis from around the world, head of different uh, synagogues. Both Israel, United States, and all over the world signed the Nostra Aetate, recognizing the Catholic Church and uniting the Catholic Church and the World Jewish Congress together. A league was formed with uh, the Jewish Congress around the world, not to be confused with the Knesset. Now, at that point there, ever since then, the Vatican has come up stronger and stronger with the Palestinian people now that this has been signed, because now they have leverage with a what would you call it, left-wing uh, group there, liberal group of rabbis there that are willing to do whatever it takes to make sure they get favor with the Vatican as they take control of Israel. So they come up strong with a little nation or a small Gentiles, as it's actually stated here in the Hebrew language. Bema'at goi, the small nation, the small Gentiles, and that is Mahmoud Abbas and his Palestinian group there. In the time of security shall he come even upon the fattest places of the province. Time of security. United Nation troops in Jerusalem. He comes up on the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them prey and spoil and substance. Yea, he shall devise his devices against fortress, but only until the time. Watch what happens here. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south. And with a great army, and the king of the south shall stir himself up to battle with a very great and mighty army. Israel is considered a great and mighty army. Now whether or not Israel ends up having any ally with it or not, I highly doubt it. But we'll see. But he shall not stand, for they shall devise devices against him. That's the sad part right there. Who will not stand? The king of the south. Prime Minister Netanyahu. Because why? They devise devices against him. That's what they're doing right now. And this may have a lot to do with the very thing going on in the Israeli government right now, especially when you look at verse 26. Yea, they that eat of his food shall destroy him, and his army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. I've stated for a long time, the only way they'll ever get the Jewish people out of Jerusalem, and especially out of the settlements when you have a half million Jews there, is by a military conflict. It looks like, though, someone in Prime Minister Netanyahu's own government 
in this case, the Attorney General, may be the very one, the man that eats of his food shall destroy him. In other words, Prime Minister Netanyahu signs his paycheck, no doubt. As the Prime Minister of Israel, he's probably the very man responsible for the payroll of the government, including the state's Attorney General. Could it be that this is a prophecy that is speaking about Prime Minister Netanyahu and the very man that could end up destroying the Prime Minister? And if Israel's Prime Minister falls in a manner such as this, and any type of military campaign is done against Israel, it would make it harder for Israel to be able to stand with a country divided. Something to think about. I can't say for certain that this is correct, but it definitely looks very interesting. Notice what it says in verse 27. As for both these kings, their heart shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper for the end remaineth yet for a time appointed. And that's one thing that can probably be said. I don't think that Prime Minister Netanyahu has necessarily been completely forthright in everything that he has had to say. And for sure, I doubt the Pope of Rome never has either. And yet they've both sat at one table already. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Do remember us when we make this trip here in January there. We will need your help in getting there to cover this momentous event there as the United Nations and 70 nations gather against the state of Israel in trying to force a two-state solution. We do intend to be there to cover it for you and to cover it live. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Visit us at IsraeliNewsLive.org. Shalom.